This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. He won't stop eating his Tillamook and he won't stop snapping his pictures. I'd almost be mad if I didn't love him so much. Dad's there, half asleep like always. Mom keeps nudging him and whispering to him that she's really not convinced his thyroid is normal. Then Dad says, my thyroid's fine, in an irritated way and goes back to being half asleep five seconds later. This is their usual dynamic. Either this or an all-out scream fight. I prefer this. Marcus, Dustin, and Scotty are there, too. I love all of them for different reasons. Marcus is so responsible, so reliable. I guess this makes sense, since he's basically an adult. He's 15, but... Even so, he seems to have a sturdiness to him that I haven't seen in many other adults around me. I love Dustin, even though he seems a bit annoyed by me most of the time. I love that he's good at drawing and history and geography, three things I'm terrible at. I try to compliment him a lot on the things he's good at, but he calls me a brown noser. I'm not sure what that is exactly, but I can tell it's an insult by the way he says it. Even so, I'm pretty sure he secretly appreciates the compliments. I love Scotty because he's nostalgic. I learned that word in the vocabulary cartoons book Mom reads to us every day because she homeschools us. Now I try to use it at least once a day so I don't forget it. It really does apply to Scotty, a sentimentality for the past. That's definitely what he has, even though he's only nine, so doesn't have much of a past. Scotty cries at the end of Christmas and at the end of birthdays and at the end of Halloween and sometimes at the end of a regular day. He cries because he's sad that it's over. And even though it barely is over, he's already yearning for it. Yearning is another word I learned in vocabulary cartoons. Mom's watching, too. Oh, Mom. She's so beautiful. She doesn't think she is, which is probably why she spends an hour doing her hair and makeup every day, even if she's just going to the grocery store. It doesn't make sense to me. I swear she looks better without that stuff, more natural. You can see her skin, her eyes, her. Instead, she covers it all up. She spreads liquid tan stuff on her face and scrapes pencils along her tear ducts and smears lots of creams on her cheeks and dusts lots of powders on top. She does her hair up all big. She wears shoes with heels so she can be five foot two because she says four foot eleven, her actual height, just doesn't cut it. It's so much that she doesn't need that I wish she wouldn't use, but I can see her underneath it. And it's who she is underneath it that is beautiful. Mom's watching me and I'm watching her and that's how it always is. We're always connected, intertwined, one. She smiles at me in a pick up the pace kind of way, so I do. I pick up the pace and finish peeling the paper off my gift. I'm immediately disappointed, if not horrified, when I see what I've received as my present for my sixth birthday. Sure, I like Rugrats, but this two-piece outfit, a t-shirt and shorts, features Angelica, my least favorite character, surrounded by daisies. I hate flowers on clothes. And there are ruffles around the sleeves and leg holes. If there is one thing I could pinpoint as being directly in opposition to my soul, it's ruffles. I love it! I shout excitedly. It's my favorite gift ever! I throw on my best fake smile. Mom doesn't notice the smile is fake. She thinks I genuinely love the gift. She tells me to put the outfit on for my party while she already starts taking off my pajamas. As she's removing my clothes, it feels more like a rip than a peel. It's two hours later. I'm standing in my Angelica uniform at Eastgate Park, surrounded by my friends, or rather, the only other people in my life who are my age. They're all from my primary class at church. Carly Reitzel's there with her zigzag headband. Madison Tomer's there with her speech impediment that I wish I had because it's so freaking cool. And Trent Page is there, talking about pink, which he does excessively and exclusively, much to the dismay of the adults around him. At first, I didn't realize why the adults cared so much about Trent's pink obsession, but then I put two and two together. They think he's gay. And we're Mormon. And for some reason, you can't be gay and be Mormon at the same time. The cake and ice cream are rolled out, and I'm thrilled. I've been waiting for this moment for two whole weeks, since I first decided what I was going to wish for. The birthday wish is the most power I have in my life right now. It's my best chance at control. I don't take this opportunity for granted. I want to make it count. Everyone sings happy birthday off key, and Madison and Trent and Carly throw in cha-cha-chas after every line. It's so annoying to me. I can tell they all think it's so cool how they're cha-cha-chawing, but I think it takes away from the purity of the birthday song. Why can't they just let a good thing be? I lock eyes with Mom so she'll know I care about her, that she's my priority. She's not cha-cha-chawing. I respect that about her. She gives me one of her big, nose-wrinkling smiles that makes me feel like everything's going to be okay. I smile back at her, trying to take in this moment as fully as I possibly can. I feel my eyes starting to water. Mom was first diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer when I was 2 years old. I hardly remember it, but there are a few flashes. There's the flash of Mom knitting me a big green and white yarn blanket, saying it was something I could keep with me while she was in the hospital. I hated it, or I hated the way she was giving it to me, or I hated the feeling I got when she was giving it to me. 
I don't remember what exactly I hated, but there was something in that moment that I absolutely did. There's the flash of walking across what must have been a hospital.